everyone. Welcome to a short introduction to polycentric governance. This is an approach that was developed by Nobel Prize laureate Eleanor Ostrom and her many collaborators. Do you still remember what a collective action problem is? According to this logic, we need to create international treaties and authorities to solve transboundary and global environmental problems because no one will change voluntarily. Yet, when you look at the multitude of environmental policy and action, it quickly becomes clear that this logic does not always apply. This is because the collective action problem assumes rational, utility maximizing actors. But what about norms and responsibilities? Some actors act because they think it's the right thing to do or because they want to take their responsibility. Otherwise, we would not reach such news. Various actors, not only nation states, but also some subnational entities, cities and private actors engage in environmental and climate action, sometimes very ambitious one. Those entities, in some cases, inspire others who then follow their lead. But there are, of course, also many entities that would never change unless they're provided with an incentive according to the logic of the collective action problem. This now brings us to polycentric governance. In polycentric governance, multiple governing authorities adopt their own measures addressing a certain problem. Many environmental problems can be adopted to achieve local benefits in addition to global ones. For example, reducing local air pollution. In such a case, the logic that individual actors don't have an incentive to address collective problems does not apply anymore. For example, Chinese climate policy is in parts driven by local air pollution problems. This is because the main cause of Chinese air pollution is coal combustion. So reducing the use of coal causes fewer greenhouse gas emissions, but also less smog at the local level. The different authorities that adopt the policy measures are formally independent of each other. They do not force each other and are not forced by an external authority or treaty to adopt their policies. This is the difference to an international treaty or organization. But this does not mean that the individual decision-making centers don't influence each other, but on a voluntary basis through, for example, learning from each other. This begs the question, can polycentric governance address and effectively solve global environmental problems? For some cases, probably. In other cases, probably not. One of the possible shortcomings is leakage. When an activity that would occur in one location is simply shifted to another location, the overall problem is not solved. For example, the reduction of harvest in one area can lead to the increase of a harvest in another. Another possible shortcoming is inconsistent policies. When policies differ, the incentive to develop a technology or another innovation may not be high enough given the size of the jurisdiction in which it could be sold. Yet another possible shortcoming is free riding. This would, was already identified by the collective action problem. Some actors can benefit from a policy adopted by another actor without themselves contributing to addressing the problem. So whether or not polycentric governance can address and effectively solve global environmental problems depends on whether the individual policies spread and the system expands. This links to policy diffusion. Global environmental governance is not only about international negotiations and treaties. At various levels of governance, 
some policy-making authorities adopt environmental policies in the absence of an international authority telling them to do so. Their motivation can be a local problem that also relates to a global environmental problem. Or a normative motivation, such as a sense of responsibility or the determination to act as a leader.